I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times, and welcome to a video conference edition of the New York Times Close Up. The U.S. is in the midst of the worst public health crisis since the flu epidemic of 1918, the deepest economic collapse since the Depression of 1929. Despite hundreds of thousands of COVID cases, tens of thousands of deaths, millions unemployed, politics has not been quarantined. Donald Trump using the daily coronavirus briefing as a substitute for his rallies. One day he's all bluster and bullying. The next day he seems subdued, almost shell-shocked. Initially, the briefings gave him a bump in the polls. That seems to be gone. In the latest NBC Wall Street Journal poll, 44% approve of his handling of the coronavirus, 52% disapprove. Joe Biden coming off a great week politically, racking up endorsements from Bernie Sanders, Barack Obama, and Elizabeth Warren. But can he capitalize on that surge in support when he's stuck in his basement doing <laughs> TV interviews? And how far can he go in attacking Trump given the gravity of the crisis? Andrew Cuomo is a breakout political star of the crisis. How should the governor deploy his newfound political prominence and muscle to help New Yorkers and to help himself? Meanwhile, of course, Mayor de Blasio seems totally overshadowed by Cuomo. Let's talk about how the pandemic is impacting the political standing of these four men. Trip Gabriel is national political correspondent for the New York Times. Clyde Haberman, a contributing writer at the Times. Eleanor Randolph, also a contributing writer and author of the superb biography, The Many Lives of Michael Bloomberg. Thank you. Trip, the last time we left you, uh, you were covering a Democratic primary campaign for the nomination for president. What happened and where do we stand now? Well, Sam, I think we all know what happened. Um, uh, Joe Biden won South Carolina on February 29th, thanks to African-American voters. And boom, you know, that uh, catapulted him right through Super Tuesday. And he cleaned up in state after state and pretty much rolled up the nomination, you know, through, I guess, uh, the March 17th states, uh, Michigan included. Sanders has endorsed uh, Biden, as you noted, uh, Obama has endorsed uh, Sanders, as you not, as as you noted, and you know it's um, it's down. You know it's it's basically wrapped up here in uh, mid-April. Uh, what uh, took in 2016 much longer uh, to take place. Uh, um, Bernie Sanders didn't endorse Hillary Clinton until uh, shortly before the July convention four years ago. So, um, you know, Democrats love to. Uh, <coughs> uh, appear to be in disarray, but uh, Democrats are no longer in disarray uh, this cycle. And, 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 and now they're facing, you know, Trump in uh, really a, a completely unprecedented uh, election year. Rip, you uh, talked to a lot of uh, uh, Bernie Sanders supporters. Uh, Bernie Sanders has endorsed Biden. What about the rank and file? Are they going to turn out next November and vote for Biden? Excellent question, Sam. I, uh, last week I interviewed 24 Sanders <coughs> primary voters from around the country. And, you know, the polls indicate that uh, about 80% of Sanders primary voters uh, will vote uh, for Joe Biden. But I, I was uh, startled in my interviews um, by how little love there is for Joe Biden and how many uh, reservations uh, Sanders supporters have about Biden. I mean, a lot of them told me, you know, he's a worse candidate uh, for, for the presidency than Hillary Clinton was, and none of them uh, particularly loved Hillary uh, uh, four years ago. So the polling indicates they'll come on board. Uh, anecdotally, uh, there was a lot of uh, sort of foot dragging and, and reluctance. Um, one of the differences this year is we don't have a third party alternative. Uh, in, in 2016, about 12% of Sanders primary voters uh, voted, uh, voted for uh, Donald Trump. And another five or six percent voted for third-party candidates, and a couple of uh, percentage uh, percentage points uh, of voters uh, didn't vote at all. So that without that third-party alternative, um, there may be a, a lot more coming home to uh, the Democratic nominee uh, Biden this time. 
Clyde and Eleanor, uh, six months from now is the election, more than six months. That's a very long time. Six months ago, we never heard of coronavirus. Uh, is there any sense that uh, Biden supporters will rally behind them? And how is the coronavirus affecting Donald Trump? Is he using it to his advantage or is this going to break him, do we think? Wow, Sam, that is a huge question and um, a sort of a double question, Sam. But so, so Trump started looking really, really good when he came out there. You know, he looked tough and, and strong. And then he, then he made so many mistakes. I, I think people are starting to be wary of, of the things that we've worried about for a very long time, which, uh, you know, are like the way he distorts the truth and the way he decides he's going to rally behind uh, a drug that is probably not, not very good. We meeting the Times editorial board. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. I'm, I'm a, an opinion writer, but, um, but the other thing about Biden that, uh, you know, I'm wondering about, and I'm sure Tripp is wondering about it too, is how usually, um, you know, every, everything gets revved up at the convention. How are you going to do that this year? You know, and, and Biden really needs some electricity in this race because he's, you know, been sitting at home. There hasn't been very much of a reaction to him and and he has half as much money as Trump. Mm -hmm. Clyde, what do you think? Well, I don't think money is going to be quite as important this time around as it was the last time. I mean, Biden had no money and Bernie Sanders had a ton of it. And look who's the nominee, just for one example. Hillary had a lot more money than Trump, I think, uh, did in 2016. Uh, and look what happened. Um, I think... I, I, one of the things that if I were a Biden advisor would be to recommend that he give a ton of interviews to local television uh, stations uh, that I'm sure would be dying to put him on and to have some content uh, other than uh, the coronavirus. Uh, that would be one way to reach voters without necessarily leaving his living room. Uh, that's one possibility. Trump's failing. The, the thing is, Trump's failings I'll, I'll quote my daughter, Maggie, uh, who writes for the Times on this. I mean, she has said repeatedly, Trump is who he was. The notion that uh, somehow this is a different person, whatever is nonsense, she's argued repeatedly, that he's always been this kind of a guy. Uh, and uh, he's not going to change. And his voters, his diehard voters are not going to change, apparently. We see this in these uh, rallies now, these so-called liberation rallies uh, in Michigan and Wisconsin and elsewhere. When Tripp said that there were 80% uh, of, uh, of Sanders voters are likely to go with, uh, with uh, Biden, that's not good enough uh, for Biden, I would argue, that considering how close the race was in 2016 in the key states of Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Michigan, um, the notion that 20% would either sit it out or waste their votes or for some bizarre reason vote for Trump could spell the difference as it did in 2016. And that worries me, quite frankly. I, I don't think I'm over-dramatizing this, but this election really is coming down to a matter of life or death. Uh, yeah. We all know or will know by November people who have died as a result of this. Uh, we have Trump again sort of running against the government, a government that is supposed to save lives and supposed to restart the economy, help people who are devastated uh, by this uh, pandemic in terms of businesses. Trip, uh, how is that going to play across the country, like Biden or don't like Biden, uh, other than that, that hardcore Trump base, which, as Clyde says, is going to vote for him no matter what? Uh, are the rest of people going to give him the benefit of the doubt when this is going on? Uh, uh, is that going to work by running against the government on issues like immigration or, or clamping down or, or becoming more lax on regulation? <laughs> We've seen what is it? Forty thousand uh, Americans, unfortunately, have have died uh, uh, from COVID nineteen to date. Um, it hasn't uh, materially dented Trump's support with his his base, and you know, 
43, 44, 45% of Americans approve of the way Donald Trump is handling things, um, <clears throat> or approve of his job you know, as, as, as president, that we have 20 million uh, unemployed Americans, uh, the economy was supposed to be his, um, his calling card for re-election. Uh, that's been removed. A lot's going to happen between now and then, but you know, going, to back, going back to what, uh, to what Clyde was talking about, um, this looks like, yet again, a, an election that's going to be fought in the northern industrial states. Our colleague Nate Silver had an interesting piece that's just up today in the Times in which he notes that the 2020 uh, general election is, is starting almost exactly where the 2016 general election ended. In other words, with, uh, you know, Joe Biden has about a five percentage point lead in national polls over Hillary Clinton. Um, the divisions between voters along education, at least among white voters uh, by education, is as stark as it was in 2016. Those states like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Florida, you know, will determine this election again. Um, not having a third party alternative for, uh, you know, for, for people who are, for, for, you know, who are, who are so-called independent voters, you know, could make a difference. Um, you know, and one of the big differences, <clears throat> Trump was deeply unpopular in 2016. You know, he had favorability ratings in the mid 30s in places like Wisconsin. The problem was that Hillary Clinton was equally unpopular and voters who disliked both candidates went for, uh, for Trump. Um, Biden has this unusual advantage right now. Um, Eleanor was worrying about him, I guess, uh, and Clyde as well being, being invisible, but uh, you can make a case that uh, his sort of Bermuda Triangle strategy, in which he's he's <laughs> or Bermuda he's, basement, could literally be in Bermuda, is not a bad thing. You know, four years ago, the Republicans had all this time to trash Hillary Clinton over Benghazi and over uh, her 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 homebrew email server. You know, Biden has kind of dropped out of the picture now, and this is increasingly at this point a referendum on Donald Trump, and that's probably the best place for uh, any Democratic presidential candidate to be uh, at the moment. Well, the flip side of that is, is Donald Trump getting too much exposure? Are these briefings uh, helping or hurting him? And also, should we or the networks be covering that all the time? Clyde, what do you think? Absolutely not. I've been saying this on Twitter for weeks, uh, an occasional rant, except that I don't feel like I'm really ranting. This is propaganda. and. Um, the, it's the same mistake that they made in 2016 of covering his rallies uh, from uh, start to finish and even before the start. They, CNN had its cameras trained on the Trump campaign plane sitting on the tarmac saying, well, we're still waiting for the candidate to come and there'd be half an hour, an hour of showing us his airplane. They're doing the same damn thing again. I understand it's because of ratings and all the rest of it. That's not good enough. This is a travesty to American democracy. I was glad to see Charles Blow, the Times columnist, pick up on this the other day also. Uh, this is not, I really believe this is a, a democratic, small d, democratic crisis that we're facing right now. Frankly, I would urge every single news organization, including our own, to send in only medical writers to those briefings and not political writers. That's never gonna happen, I know that. But if this is indeed the crisis that we all know it, it to be, let's put the resources where they belong and they do not belong with cameras trained on a guy ranting and raving and swinging wildly from day to day on that which he wants to do. Uh, it, it, it really makes me crazy on this one because uh, I truly believe that our democracy is on the line here. Paul Krugman uh, on the op-ed page, who is not known for his subtlety, says, we are much closer to losing our democracy than many people realize, looking what's happening in Eastern Europe and other places in reaction to coronavirus and what's happening uh, even before that. Do you agree or do we think that's an overstatement? Uh, Are you asking me? Uh, yes. Well, you know, okay, <laughs> all right. I mean- they Give me um, the easy ones. I've, <laughs> that's right, thanks, thanks a lot. No, I, I've, I'm among those who are terrified by watching every time this guy talks about how, you know, I, I'm, the, I'm the king, basically, of the country, and, and his uh, attorney general has decided they're going to come after states if they don't 
um, they, they don't operate the way Trump wants them to do. I mean, what's the, what he's doing that is, is, is absolutely terrifying is that he's, he's, uh, he's, we had this, we have this government of checks and balances. He's trying to move away the checks and balances. And so you, you see that on so many levels. I mean, I think to me, one of the very important things that will happen uh, this year is the, the question of what happens to the Congress. Because, um, uh, you know, I mean, the Senate is very close. This, the Senate could turn Democratic uh, after November. I mean, it, it's at least a possibility, which it wasn't la really wasn't last time. And the Democrats need to hold on to the House. And so, I mean, I, I just, to me, uh, you know, as as Andrew Cuomo said, the guy is not a king. He's not our king. Speaking of Andrew Cuomo, let's look at the situation a little closer to home. He seems to be, by all accounts, handling the situation remarkably well. His new prominence, uh, his his ability to come to grips with this situation, is that going to gain him any points beyond New York? Uh, or should we just credit him as uh, being a, a great leader in a time of crisis, Glad? Well, there's nothing wrong with doing good for good's own sake. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be rewarded uh, in, in the political sense. Uh, I take him at his word that he's not interested in somebody coming in and announcing that they want to declare him uh, the Democratic candidate. So that's not going to happen. And he's going to have to worry in two years about uh, getting his uh, getting reelected again if he chooses to run. As we've noted in, on this show uh, in the past, um, New Yorkers tend to tire of their leaders after three terms. Koch, Mario Cuomo, uh, Al D'Amato, all tried for fourth terms, all failed. Uh, will Andrew be different? Perhaps, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily bet on it. Also, it is always remarkable how short voter memories are, and uh, I see no reason uh, to, to change on that score either. Tripp, are Congress and, uh, and uh, the Federal Reserve running out of tools? And is Trump himself running out of tools? He had a very cooperative meeting with Cuomo the other day, uh, but how much more can Washington actually do? You know, I think that's such a mystery, and it is to me as well. And <clears throat> one of the uh, insane things that's taken place in this pandemic is this, you know, uh, President Trump uh, on one day asserting that he has complete control over when states will reopen uh, for formal business and then <clears throat> the next day you know uh, throwing it back to the governors to say it's up to you guys and and, and gals and, and and that's correct uh, constitutionally um you know cuomo was down in washington meeting with president trump yesterday at the white house to talk about uh testing which is a major uh you know it's, it's a factor of great of, of crucial importance into into reopening states and there's just not enough tests to go around i mean the president uh and seems to have, you know, uh, <clears throat> gotten to a point where he's going to give New York some assistance on, uh, on, a, on greatly expanding the testing. And that's, that's a win for uh, Andrew Cuomo. Um, you know, he the, gets it. Excuse yeah. me? He gets it. Yeah. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, you know, ventilators, testing, um, the, the hospital ship comfort, you know, which docked in Manhattan. I mean, it's, it's not, frankly, it's not President Trump's fault alone. I mean, a lot of you know authorities have been kind of you know feeling their way through uh, through this uh, this very difficult crisis, um, but it's certainly not helped by uh, really a an assertion of federal control, but uh, but then you know a a, a kind of uh, you know, just falling down repeatedly on, on on following through with the mechanics and 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 and, and, and actual leadership and, and and governance. And you know in terms of where the Federal Reserve you know is going to run out of money. To uh, to help you know uh, uh, small businesses and individuals who are, who are unemployed, um, it seems like the government has decided the well is bottomless. You know whatever those deficits, what's a deficit? You know the, the the numbers that are being thrown around. You know it's it's a great benefit to the federal government. They can they can print the money. Um, states don't have that option, obviously. But, and in uh, terms of, if I may, in terms of the state and the city, the city 
as we know, is required to have a balanced budget. And it is now billions in the hole. The state has a similar problem. And the, the cuts that are going to have to be made are going to be drastic. Uh, you know, and part of it, I, I don't want to turn this into a blame game, but part of it was that Mayor de Blasio spent a lot of money that really couldn't be counted on forever and ever. Uh, if you took Bloomberg's last budget, and adjusted it for inflation over the last six years or so, it should be about 78 billion or so. But the city budget that the mayor proposed, this mayor proposed in January was 95 billion. Uh, so there's, I'm not saying these are bad programs that, that he's proposed, but they're perhaps unaffordable in certain cases. And the uh, municipal uh, payroll expanded tremendously uh, uh, over the last six years or so. Um, I think it's going to be the mid 70s redux to some degree, which means Ouch. it's going to be worn a lot tighter this year. Very interesting. He was the first uh, progressive mayor, at least in my memory, who uh, was working with a windfall, unlike Lindsay, unlike Dinkins. Uh, he had a lot of money at his disposal. But uh, David Goodman in the Times had a story the other day quoting Greg. Bishop, the commissioner of the city small business agency, saying, I don't think the New York that we left will be back for some years. I don't know if we'll ever get it back. Now, we survived the 70s fiscal crisis. We survived September 11th. We survived the 20, uh, 2008 banking crisis. What's going to be different about this, if anything? Eleanor? Well, you know, I, uh, de Blasio has said that he's facing a $10 billion deficit, which is just astonishing. And he said, what he says mm -hmm. is that if he doesn't get money from the federal government, he's going to have to cut services. Well, you and I know as soon as services get cut, everything else starts to diminish. Now, um, uh, in my neighborhood, for example, um, uh, the, uh, it's so quiet at night, it's absolutely terrifying, and stores are starting to board up. You're, st you're starting to see some really alarming um, street scenes in, in the city of New York, and, and I was so glad that J. David wrote that piece because it really gave, uh, gave you an idea of what could happen to this city um, now, I have to say there are some people who say, look, you know, New York is full of all these incredibly inventive and creative people and, and we will find a way to move forward. And I, I think that is, that is true. But, you know, I just we're going to be digging our way out of a very big hole. Yeah. Clyde, what do you think? We've been resilient before. Uh, but we have not had so many people affected by a crisis this way. As terrible as September 11th was, it affected a relatively limited portion of our population, many of whom, by the way, did not live in the city. And so they were, they were not fully part of the city fabric. I, I don't mean to, I'm not demeaning them in any way. Uh, it affected our economy in many ways, but it wasn't citywide. And, 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 and the same could be said to some degree about the 2008 crisis. And Lord knows there were panics in the 19th century and the Great Depression of 1929 and years following. I count myself among those who have been uh, amazed. I guess I wonder sometimes was my head totally in the sand. I have been floored by how quickly so many of our citizens were broke after a week or two of where, without having a job. Um, and the, I don't know how we get back to that. I don't know how restaurants are ever gonna, and which is such a critical part of our economy, are ever gonna come back, or Broadway, uh, or movie theaters. And as you start reading how the coronavirus can be distributed much further than the six feet that we're all distancing ourselves uh, uh, because of uh, air conditioning and other forms of ventilation, that the notion that you can have a 150 seat restaurant again strikes me as uh, impossible, at least for the next couple of years. And so a lot of businesses are never going to reopen, uh, I fear. I, 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 I just don't know how we get back to where we were within a reasonable time period. Tripp, a uh, quick uh, answer from you. 
Clyde is very pessimistic, and I have to uh, sadly say I, I I agree with a lot of that. It, it you know, New York is the hot spot internationally uh, currently for the coronavirus pandemic uh, because of it's a city in which people are packed together, and and that's what makes New York great. Uh, our restaurants, our cultural institutions, the subways, you know, the things that make urban life um, exciting in New York are exactly um, the aspects that are being targeted by. Uh, by a, by a pandemic and it is you know to see states you know with protesters saying let's open up and some governors such as in Georgia and in South Carolina moving to open up you know New York is is just not going to be on that pathway for a very long time the ticker tape parade might not be enough to do it thanks no. to my guests Trip Gabriel Clyde Haberman Eleanor Randolph for the New York Times for the New York Times and CUNY TV thanks for joining us on the New York Times close up